final public sermon, final sermon at essentially the pilgrimage. And he tells his followers, okay, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here, so these are my final words, take them seriously. Okay. An Arab is not superior over a non-Arab. A non-Arab is not superior over an Arab. Okay. Equality. A black is not superior over a white. A white is not superior over a black. Equality. Okay. Men have rights over women. Women have rights over men. Should I say equality? <laughs> but as long as you follow the book and my way, you have nothing to worry about. You will not fall astray. So this final point is what? When I said at the beginning that there's volumes upon volumes of narrations quoting him, citing him, and then volumes upon volumes to test how much of that is authentic. And on top of that, he is the most sacred man in the world for so many of the people in this room. More sacred than their own parents, more sacred than their own children, more sacred than their own selves. What are we saying ultimately? That he is one of the primary methods for connecting to God. And that ultimately, well, good timing, that ultimately uh, is what is most important for everybody else in this room. So with that, I thank you for your time, and I hope I've kept a few of you awake. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to entertain. But otherwise, peace be upon you all. No, you're not expected. Uh, this would be something that you may want to do just to uh, express respect if you choose to do so. But this is not an obligation on non-Muslims. I mean, if you're not a believer in the faith, then you're obviously not. And you don't look at him as the prophet of God, you're obviously not obliged to say peace be upon him. But, for example, uh, I will refer to Augustine as Saint Augustine, right? I will refer to Father such and such as Father such and such, right? So, in terms of of just what we'd call good manners might be a good idea. You'll really get the appreciation of all the Muslims in the room if you do that, right? So if you want to sell them something, it's better to do that, right? No, but in terms of just discourse, it's a nice, it's a nice gesture. But you're not under any obligation. Yeah. Nice question. Any other questions? You have a question? Uh, okay, fine. Okay, fire away. Um, you might want to face the crowd so they can hear your question. I guess it's kind of like a, like a two-part. Uh oh. <laughs> the first is, if we have like such a, such an extensive, like science, you know, of analyzing the hadith, and such like a, like a wide body of literature, you know, how do we not only have like strong and weak, you know, hadith? But we also have like like a Sunni body of hadith and a Shia. Oh, nice question. Okay, okay. Is that both parts? That's only sound like one part. Oh, uh, the second part I wanted to ask about like the infallibility. Okay, okay, great question. All right. So, <clears throat> just to repeat the question. We have this massive body of hadith. These narrations attributed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, in terms of things he said, things he did, he did, or things he's reported to have witnessed. And then we have a Sunni body of hadith, a Shia body of hadith. So you probably heard the term Shia. I prefer Shia or Shi'i. Shi'ite sounds very nasty, okay, right? Sunni, Shia, or Shi'i.
there's also a third sectarian group that nobody's ever heard of, okay, called the Ibadis. There's actually three major Muslim groups throughout history, Sunni, Shi'i, and Ibadi. Okay. Now, what are the actual differences? If you ask a common Sunni or Shi'i today, they'll say the difference is over who should have been the successor to Muhammad, peace be upon him. That's actually not correct. That is a place of disagreement, but that's not where the difference is. Differences in sources of knowledge, sources of guidance. Okay. So, Sunni and Shia tradition both start with the Quran, with the Prophet, peace be upon him. Now, in terms of narrations, Sunnis tend to take the body of companions of Muhammad, the followers of Muhammad. They would be sort of the parallel of the disciples of Jesus, right? The followers of Muhammad. We use the language companions. Yeah. In Shi'i tradition, privilege is given to those companions who are part of his direct family. Okay. His direct family through his daughter and her husband, Ali, and their two sons. Okay. So they privilege uh, specific companions. Now, so what are the further differences? They both follow the Quran, they both follow the Prophet, peace be upon him, but they privilege different sets of narrators. Then, in Shia tradition, there are figures called the Imams, who are descendants of the Prophet, peace be upon him, through his daughter, through their son-in-law, through his son-in-law, okay? A set of figures who are looked at as, to use Sunni language, rightly guided. And these figures are looked at as the sources of knowledge, the sources of guidance in the tradition. Okay. And then from there, you have the legacy of scholars, the community, and your own intellect. Now, in practice, Sunni and Shia is not like Catholic and Protestant. Okay. Uh, if you watch the news, you'll think it's worse, right? Back in the 80s, we had Catholics and Protestants fighting in Ireland. Today, we have Muslims, uh, Sunnis, and Shias fighting in, in Iraq. That's more political as rather than denominational. The overlap is actually pretty surprising. Right? It's probably fair to say that about 60% of the narrations of Sunni Hadith are found in Shia narrations, through different chains. Right? And the other 40%, even those differences are not as much. There are differences. right? There are narrations that are given more attention in Sunni tradition than in Shia tradition. But it's not as much of a difference as we'd imagine. The difference is in methodology. And then how the methodology plays out in personal life in America will be different than if you go to the subcontinent versus if you go to Iraq and elsewhere. You know? So the point being that when I'm speaking of all these narrations, I'm speaking of Sunni and Shi'i narrations. Right. Okay. The other questions um, expand on the infallibility um, of the prophet you're saying. I'm going to say he has perfect character. Like the prophet, like what, <clears throat> what exactly infallibility entails and I guess it would extend to Okay. The so, so again, uh, infallibility. When I'm saying that the Prophet, peace be upon him, has perfect character, what does this mean? Perfect in his obedience to the divine. Meaning, he does not disobey the divine. Okay. This, in Shia tradition, also applies to the Imams. Right? That they are perfect in their obedience to the divine. Okay. And so, what are we saying here? that a sin is an act of disobedience. Some will include only willful, some will say willful and unwillful, but in the case of prophets, uh, any act of disobedience will not be found. They will make mistakes. Even the prophet, peace be upon him himself, is being corrected in the Quran for mistakes in his choices. Not acts of disobedience, not moral uh, uh, infractions, which essentially are synonymous. But the most famous case that just about all the Muslims are familiar with is this time when he's trying to get the attention of one of the leaders of Mecca to call them to the message. Meanwhile, a blind man is coming to him asking about the message, and he's tugging at his rope. And then Muhammad, peace be upon him, says to him, paraphrase, I'll be with you in a moment. And the man continues to tug, and Muhammad frowns at him. Now think about this. The frown of the prophet is not going to be like this growl. It's going to be very, very subtle and he's frowning to a blind man. The blind man does not see the frown. Okay. But God still reprimands him. Reprimands him is the right word, corrects him. Okay. So he does make those choices that get corrected. So that's essentially the Islamic idea of infallibility. And you're staring at me right now, so I don't know if you're processing or... Yeah. Okay, sounds good.
Yes, ma'am. You're referring to the opposite with Linda. Isn't there also historical background where, I mean, coming from a Shia background, I'll just yeah. put it out there. Far away. Um, I was at Wazwada actually historically, I mean, a lot of people say it's on the Prophet's law, said that, but as Shia, we believe that it was not the Prophet's law. Sure. That's fair, right? Uh, it doesn't change the point, though, right? The point is still the same, right? That in both traditions, he's looked at as infallible. Right, I mean, granted, one of the main differences is but let's say that if the Prophet has is infallible, has morality, perfect morality, we've forgot, has perfect characteristics, why does he not act on those perfect characteristics? Uh, explain it further. Morality. Take it further. Okay, so um, the Prophet, sorry, is that You might have to stand so people can hear you. Hey, there's a mic. Oh. I can just talk to you there if you want. All right, looks like we have a second speaker here. Let's give her a round of applause. Hi, Sam. How are you? I'm good. Okay, so um, in Shia tradition, just throwing this out, I mean, we have a couple of Shias in this room, so if anyone wants to correct me at any point in case I make a mistake, come up here. Um, one of the main differences between Shia and Sunni differences is the character of the Prophet. So was when uh, viewing multiple hadiths, for example, you see that, as Woody mentioned, not all the hadiths are the same. Not all of the actions of the Prophet ﷺ committed were the same. Because to us, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is perfect, is infallible, does not make mistakes. So we can look at that as saying he is perfect in the sense that he does not disobey God. Perfect in the sense that his morality is perfect, his judgment is perfect, he doesn't act in ways that he should not act, because as a Muslim, I personally would not follow anyone if they made mistakes. Why should I, as a person, follow someone who is not infallible? And so the way we see it is, I was a Wazawala was not talking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because as a perfect being, he would not have run. He would not have acted in such a way. Okay. To have morality and to have perfect judgment would mean that you wouldn't, basically. Okay. So, do you want me to answer as a debate, or do you want me to answer uh, in a friendly way? I'm not educating, so I prefer friendly. Okay, okay. What did you say? Story. No. <laughs> okay, okay. So, oh, stay okay. here. I mean, you move there, so. <laughs> okay. So, there's a few issues here. Uh, first and foremost, what is the source material that we're using to determine that Abu Sawatawalla is referring to the Prophet or not? What is the source material? Um, I mean, I can listen to you. Far away. Quran. Go further. Where in the Quran? Where in the Quran? Surah Al-Asad. Go further. The first time. Who is it referring to? It's general. It's general. general. The language is singular, grammatically singular. Right? So who is it referring to? The point that I'm making here is that the commentary on the Quran is coming from additional sources. So the difference of opinion is not in the text, right? The difference of opinion is where are we getting the source material from, right? And so this becomes a difference of opinion in terms of what we mean by infallibility. You see what I'm saying? Continue. What? <laughs> Do you have more arguments? <laughs> well, my one thing was the infallibility, so he mentioned yeah. like the infallibility. So essentially what we're saying here is that in Sunni tradition, infallibility is referring to morality, obedience to God. In Shi'i tradition, the argument is that even there are no mistakes. Yeah. Okay. Now, if we go further and say, I'm not going to follow someone who's going to make a mistake, that becomes debate language. Right? You don't want to get into debate language. Right? So we're leaving it at this, right? That there is a difference on the definition of infallibility. That's all. I was okay, just going to ask question. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, uh, this is, this is... Wait, so, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Garrett, and I'm so happy to be here. Sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so, uh, the question that I originally had was, uh, at the beginning, as the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, began his, his teaching, and began his preaching. Uh, you mentioned that he was in places that were probably either Jewish or Christian around that time. There were, there were others present.